good evening, everyone. A uh, very warm welcome. Uh, on behalf of the Freud Museum, my name is Emilia, and I work in the education team here. And we couldn't be more excited to be hosting this event. It's a great honor, not just because of the wonderful subject matter, and it just uh, you just happen to be sitting in Freud's former bedroom, just over there, that part of the room, used to be his bedroom. Although he, he did, to be fair, he didn't spend much time here because he was quite frail, so there was a lift installed for him to make it to the bedroom, but that was already very difficult because Freud was quite frail by the time, having suffered from an oral cancer for over 16 years. So he was actually mainly sleeping and dreaming downstairs uh, in his study, where another couch was put up for him, uh, overlooking the garden. Uh, in any case, this is the house where Freud lived. To those of you who are new to us, uh, this is Sigmund Freud's final home. He did live here for the final 12 months of his life. He continued uh, working here. He continued seeing his patients. As I said, he continued sleeping and dreaming here. Um, and so this is a very fitting place to have such a wonderful uh, book launch. We are really excited because uh, as the museum, we had the honor of hosting quite a few of mm -hmm. Uh, dreams are the um, events here, and I had the pleasure of witnessing them, participating in them, and uh, I just couldn't be more proud of what you came up with, and, and just it's wonderful for the museum to know that something Freud started so many years ago, in 19, uh, 1900, is still something that people are so interested in as to build an entire massive project around it. Uh, Freud was the first one to write about dreams in such a way as to link it with something about our inner lives. And his book, The Interpretation of Dreams, was his dearest one. So he said at some point that if he were to save just one uh, book, one work from everything he'd written, it would certainly be The Interpretation of Dreams. So it, not, it is not just one of Freud's theories or one of Freud's books, it's certainly the one that he identified with the most. And what is particularly interesting is that this is the one when he opens up the most in terms, of, in terms of his private life, in terms of his inner life, to the audience. And partly trying to really be the outreach worker and spreading um, the knowledge of psychoanalysis, what he knew about the unconscious mind, essentially. And he did say that he had to pay a very heavy price for it, for uh, you know, telling his own dreams and what people might make out of it. But I think the power of that book is uh, so much in the fact that it was so personal. And uh, in terms of w listening and witnessing Mark and Julia's events, I've always been really struck by two things, personally. So it's a bit of a kind of personal thing. I've never told them. <laughs> I hope they take them well. Uh, it's precisely it's something very similar. Uh, Mark, from a scientific background, just the way he talks. Mark, you talk to people. Um, about their dreams, the way you ask, the way you probe, it's just, it's just so sensitive. It's just so beautiful with a true art of a clinician. Uh, obviously, what you're doing is not a clinical practice, but the sensitivity of it, the, the asking just the right questions, doing it in a way that kind of transmits huge respect to people's inner life, not sort of uh, being too penetrative, not bringing anything too much. There's this amazing respect and so inspiration just to, to hear people talking because ultimately this is not supposed to be clinical practice. You know, you are teaching us how to talk to each other about it and you just bring this amazing quality to it. And Julia, what you're doing is just incredible how this, the art that Julia does finds its way, its way around Freud's work. I think in a way this is another duo. So you're one duo, but this is another one. Just how well your works work with uh, Freud's own interpretation of dreams, because to those of you who might not yet know about it, Julia's works, as you can see, they are exhibited here and around the museum. Uh, the paintings are done on the books of Freud's actual interpretation of dreams, which is really very moving. And to be able to position that, uh, the, the beautiful painting, to choose the right, just the way you look at the pages, the way you locate it, there's something truly spectacular about it, true art. But more than that, so when I'm thinking about the two of you and your project, it's like, what happens when art and science come together? And the answer is magic. <laughs> magic happens. And this is, uh, and I'm so impressed. When we were working together during the pandemic, Matt and Julia were kind enough to record a video for us. We have an exhibition about Freud and the pandemic. 
Um, and uh, you were sharing your insights about dreams during the pandemic. And we spent hours recording it and re-recording mm -hmm. it. And I was just so touched by uh, your dedication to it and the sense of the mission in a way of how much this, these topics can mean to people. <coughs> Not just, I think, in, 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 it's perhaps, in a way, this wasn't anything new because you seem to have always believed in the power of dreams and sharing them. And the pandemic nearly proved that. Uh, but uh, just your dedication to it makes this whole subject matter potentially transformation to everyone. They are talking about it beautifully in the book, mm -hmm. uh, so it's something that everybody can do. It's not just an interesting book, just like the, your collaboration is not just interesting. It's something so hugely inspiring, and it's something that can potentially be transformation to all of us. And particularly at times of a you know, very polarized world, and people trying to reconnect after the pandemic, it is certainly one of the greatest ideas to do, to think, to look inside, to think about our inner life, and think about dreams. So we are so honored to have you both here. We are excited to have all of you here, and we hope that maybe you will have time later on also, you probably have seen uh, the house. We think it's a very good match <laughs> in any case. So without further ado, I'm going to, um, so this is also Marnie, uh, right, another friend, I think we are all being a family, and we are very excited to have you here as well. Um, I know about the dream you shared with Mark and Julia, and uh, you're one of the people who benefited from what they're doing in a very direct way, so I hope you'll share a bit of that as well, uh, from the kind of first-person perspective, almost. Uh, and yeah, it would be lovely to hear the questions you have to ask to them because you've been a big fan of this project, right? For how long now? Oh, well, the pandemic meant that I lost track of time. Mm. I have absolutely no, how many, no idea how many years yeah, it is now. A couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is this your first time at the museum? Yes, it is. Yes, so a very warm welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what Freud was doing here, asking people questions. Right, okay, so, uh, I'm, yeah, so just start whenever you're ready. Uh, I think everybody can, uh, can everybody hear Mark and Julia, if you would just say something. It's lovely to see um, so many old friends, but also so many new faces, so that's uh, it's wonderful. Thank you for coming. My turn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I got to know these two um, through my job, and I make nerdy radio programs for BBC, and um, so, I, so I'm one of the presenters on Inside Science on Radio 4, but I also work for the World Service on a program called Crowd Science, which is actually a couple of fun. We get listeners from all over the world who ask us questions, and we turn them into custom documentaries. And it was in the course of making one of those about why do we dream um, that I came to Swansea, uh, armed with my dream diary, and was told, um, so just tell us about one of your dreams. Now, I hadn't had that many dreams, or none that I remembered, and the ones that I had remembered, and I was told very nicely, there's no such thing as a boring dream. Although when I was relaying the third one that was I was in an office meeting. <laughs> I went, oh, is, is there any anything else? <laughs> uh, is, there, is there another one that's not that, um, that, that stuck with you over the years? And it, it just happened that there was, and there was one that just it had a different texture to other dreams, and it was just uh, vivid, and it, uh, I have four brothers, and it was um, the second youngest one, and I was in my parents' which is in uh, Surrey countryside, in the middle of a big wood, and I was just very aware that suddenly that he was dead. And I walked down the road, to, which is uh, a sort of road with high sides that we used to have to walk up to, to get to the house, and the car whizzed down there at about 60 miles an hour, and um, found his crushed body and sort of picked him up and cuddled him. And it was really upsetting actually and it, the, the thing that struck me was he's not dead he's absolutely <coughs> fine but it's still years on from having that um, it still triggers very strong emotions and and the, so that made me it, it really hits you the power yeah. that dreams have to affect you and um, and then as I was recounting this Julia was 
was painting it. And then it ended up as one of the dreams in this book. And so when they said, but come and ask us about it. <laughs> <laughs> so so that's, that's that, really. Um, it was one of the rare dreams, actually, where you um, showed me a picture of the house. So the house is actually reasonably accurate to yes. your house. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I could see in this drawing, and, and, and you'd circled various words that within the text that just happened to be relative to the to the um, the dream itself. There we are. Oh, there's Marnie in the, the sleep lab. You'd actually tried to sleep in the lab to have a lucid dream. I failed. It's difficult to sleep. Yes. <laughs> Sleeping when someone tells you to. Yeah. When there's three people. The other side of a very thin wall, waiting for you, your brainwaves to tell tell them that you've gone to sleep is quite intimidating. So, yeah. And that is a picture. That, well, that was the, uh, the artwork. Yeah. And then yeah. Your stream underneath. And you're cradling your brother's body. Yeah. yeah. And Julia had found, uh, which is something she'll talk about later, she found two pages where there was a a white space across the pages yeah, it was a gully. Mm. to make a, um, a windy lane. So she found that while Marnie was telling the dream and, and structure for painting around that, around the idea that there was a, a windy white bit going through what Freud had written. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, yeah, so tell me about the rest of the book that's not my dream. <laughs> right, okay, thank you. Well, I was going to quickly, before passing over to Julia, tell you about why the book is as it is, and also in a way that, that leads to the chronology of how it was written, and, and why it was written. The, the first few chapters are standard sleep and dreaming science, which in a way almost anybody could have written. And it's, it's about why we dream, or oh, so not why we dream, it's about what from waking life goes into our dreams. What affects the content of the dreams? Why do some people dream more than others? Is that a psychological factor, or do they have more active brains during the night? Um, then it moves on to lucid dreams, and why do some people have lucid dreams, and what happens in the brain when you've got a lucid dream, a dream where you know you're dreaming? Um, and then all the science of nightmares. Why do some people have more nightmares than others, and what causes nightmares? So, all of, and then chapters on what happens in the brain when you're dreaming. So waking people up and finding out, I dream or not, what's happened to their EEG at that point, um, to their brain waves. So all that was, you know, it's very up to date and it's got our own slants on it. Um, and it then goes into the meaningfulness of dreams. And that's where it starts to get a little bit, bit, of a bit different. You know, Freud was a bit disparaged about one of his patients called Dora, and we've done a whole chapter on how what Freud found about Dora was actually very sensitive of him, that he believed that she was being um, sexually harassed, whereas her parents didn't. And uh, she left, and she, she spoke two dreams to him, so we detailed the dreams there. She's a bit of a feminist hero because she walked out of Freud after 11 weeks, and that's usually what people concentrate on, but the dreams she had really do show her meaningfulness of her dreams. And so that's all about the meaning and possible functions of dreams, but then what had happened was Julia and I had started working together and we'd started, which as Julia will mention in a moment, sort of realising how much dream telling affects people. And so that's really why the book then started to be written, because there was something novel to say there. There's lots of people out there who think that dreams have a function of affecting the brain during the night. And we deal with that as a possibility in the book. But we then start to deal with the possibility that dreams might equally have, or only have, could be either, a function of bonding us to each other when we tell them. And so the later parts of the book then go on to that with a side line of surrealism and surrealist films and surrealist art and about uh, how we how we've done it ourselves uh, in our in our project and uh, but like I said it wouldn't have happened 
the second half of the book is what's super original. The first part is up to date and good. The second half is super original. With um, lots of people <coughs> disputing it. Yeah. Or and what we link it to self-domestication <coughs> of human beings. And that we all domesticate ourselves as humans. We, we, we only mate with the people who are calmer and more decent. There are, there's whole theories about humans are domesticating each other in the same way we've domesticated cats and dogs. So we ended up that was the end of the book. But above all, we wanted to have a book that had real dreams for each chapter and a painting of each dream, which is the start of it. And so without that, we wouldn't have got Routledge's interest. And Routledge is one of the very top publishers, as you no you doubt know. No. So they, they were really taking it. I'm really incredibly grateful to Routledge for agreeing for, for, uh, agreeing to the book offer. Um, that, that was really good of them. But it wouldn't have happened without Julia at all painting the dreams and listening to the dreams and the effects that were happening there. So I will pass over to Julia. Mm. Who, who's do, got, is um, it okay if I book. sit down and read or do you want me to stand up at the back? You're, you're okay? Can we stand up? <coughs> right, I will stand up, but uh, it's a bit odd. <laughs> 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 anyway. In the summer of 2016, the British Science Association was due to hold its annual British Science Festival in Swansea. Following Mark's experiences and and research and discussing dreams using the Ullman technique, which we'll talk about in more detail, he wanted to propose an evening session for the public coming to an open air event in which he would discuss the dreams of anyone attending. This would use the Ullman method, as described in chapter 10, but with a short time frame of 15 to 20 minutes per person. The festival planned to have an evening event it was called Creatures of the Night, and it was indeed full of Creatures of the Night. It was in this um, kind of uh, pyramid that was full of cockroaches. <laughs> 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 they all came up, and I had skirts on, which I rarely wear a skirt, and they, all, they were going up my legs. It was horrible. <laughs> and it really was quite horrible. Anyway, I'll skip over that bit. The festival was planned to have an evening event for Creatures of the Night, in an educational tourist attraction, rainforest-themed nature centre, a striking glass-sided large pyramidal building in Swansea. Mark talked his idea over with me, who suggested that I could paint quickly each dream while the discussion of it occurred. So these were 15 minutes. People walked up, said, this is what the dream is. I drew it, tore it out, gave it to them, and they walked off, right? We agreed that each dreamer would be given the painting to document their participation in the site-specific performance and to enable them to use the painting to further consider the dream and the discussion at home with family and friends and across time after the event. On the evening, the event was magical, with dim light, dim light trees everywhere and various arts-based science exhibits and performances. We sat at a table at the top of the uh, spiralling path up through the rainforest themed environment and with a large screen behind us, much like this one, on which was live projected a film of each painting as it was being made. So this was really the, the sort of the first time we did this. And so all the elements were there, but then we, we kind of developed it over the, over the years. Um, so as described in chapter 10, the, dream, the group dream discussion method, the Allman method, traces back the components of the dream to the dreamer's re recent waking life experiences in recognition of the discussion method being partly derived from the pre-association pre technique of Sigmund Freud. And to make the painting more memorable, I suggested that each painting could be made onto one or two pages taken from Freud's book, The Interpretation of Dreams. We obtained the kind permission of the publishers, Wordsworth Editions, to do this, using the first English translation of the book. When the dreamer, share, the dreamer dream sharer first tells their dream, I use its narrative structure, for example, the number of scenes, environmental features, and presence of objects, to select pages from the book by identifying visually relevant shapes in the paragraphs and text on the page, including shapes of any footnotes, bullet points, or diagrams. This then structures the underlying composition of the painting. While, painting. while the painting is being made, I incorporate relevant words from the page into the painting as objet trouvé. So this is where we started to notice kind of links to surrealism. 
as these words are not spotted when the pages are chosen, it's eerie, and it really is eerie, how relevant these words can be. And it adds to the magic, we've mentioned magic tonight, um, to the magic uh, of the painting. That words written by Freud, albeit originally in German, become part of the artwork themselves like three associations. And I'll stop there. <coughs> Thank you. So, can I ask who you'd like to read the book? Who, who is it for? Well, I think the people in this room. <laughs> <laughs> but just sort of <clears throat> people who are interested in dreaming. Um, I suppose with Routledge we had to pitch that it was for, um, you know, would, would be really relevant to psychology. Psych psychology students because there's a lot of, as Mark said at the beginning, there's a lot of up to very up-to-date research on dreaming and sleep. So, you know, we, we did want uh, it to be relevant to, to students. But really, it's written in such a way, as you can hear, you know, it's readable, it's very readable. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping, you know, everything we do is about trying to bring um, dreaming, but not just dreaming, the socialization of dreaming, to the general public because we think it's really valuable. And, and the painting is the paintings are integral to the book. Yes, the paintings are. Uh, they they start each chapter, so each chapter begins with a painting. So when you can't remember what a chapter's about, you can <laughs> see the painting as a kind of. Yes. Oh, it's the one with the like. I think I did it earlier. The one with the with the girl yeah. with the yeah. thing. That's what I did too. I said yeah. I'm going to read that. It's the one with the um, the cop. There's a cop standing in the street, and it's that one. So it becomes almost a mnemonic, in a way, a mnemonic reading for what's in the chapter, and that's how we chose them. And of course, it that all happened backwards. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't choose to do the painting. It all happened the other way around, didn't it? Hmm. Yeah. We were writing the chapters, and then we had to sift through dreams that we discussed with people with their associated paintings that had happened over the previous six years or so, but in a way, the, the inclusion of the paintings is to remind everybody that, because there are lots of books about dream out there, and, and there, a lot of them are really wonderful, um, but the inclusion of artwork was to sort of remind people that, you know, you could get back to the visual aspect of the dream, and, mm -hmm. albeit it's Julia's painting of it, it's an interpretation yeah. of it, um, it takes you back to the visual aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to know a little bit more about that interpretation. So it's, uh, you have to crank these out quite fast. Yeah. There's well, no, it's unbelievable when I start doing <coughs> them in 15 minutes. And yeah, so there is a technique. And, and in fact, Paul, who's sitting in the audience, so it's a bit like improv comedy. Mm. So you've got, a, you've, got, you've got a kind of technique to, right, that paragraph will hold that part of the story. So I'm, I'm looking at the plots, really, of the narratives. And when the plots go, oh, and then they went through a wall and, and they were over in that castle, you know, I, I kind of have to use each paragraph almost as a container. And then by chance, I've, I've looked at the paragraphs, I've found the containers, and then the words start coming out. The words come out of the discussion. So they are relevant to the discussion. And I don't know what's going to be in the discussion, so they are kind of magical to me. I, sometimes I, I'm, I'm gasping, because oh, I don't speak at all. That's why I'm going on now. But, <laughs> <laughs> because I'm a bit nervous. But, you know, I don't speak at all during the, the, the session. Mark does everything. And I just have my head down. I go into a different place. I, I just go into the dream. And I walk around in the dream uh, using a very clear structure. Okay. Yeah. So you're, you're listening. Um, Mark, what are you doing at that point? For, for everything during then, I'm very much focused on the dreamer, but also needing to focus on whether other people who are in the group are wanting to ask questions to the dreamer, such as what was in the dream, or when we're at the stage of the technique where you talk about their life, they'll be wanting to ask questions about the person's life. So mainly the, the technique aims to get as much detail as possible about the dream and then as much possible about the person's waking life. So I'm focusing on the dreamer so that they can say as much as possible of those things. 
uh, gently probing about the dream or about their waking life. Um, it did get quite um, multitasking when we were doing it online during the pandemic because you have a lot of comments coming in on Facebook Live and Julia's painting is there being shown and people are typing all these comments in and, and things. So it's in a way keeping an eye on what people are wanting to ask uh, and also making sure that there's enough information there about the dream for Julia to just herself be, be painting it. Um, it was all, it's all quite novel to me. It became novel to me. What had happened was I'd done sleep memory and dreaming research for years. The, the experimental psychology stuff in a sleep lab. And then one day I went along to a dream group at a conference on dreaming. And it suddenly hit me that you could actually find stuff out from dreams by discussing them rather than turning them into... The, the numbers are good, and I still do that. But that having an almost, almost open-ended discussion about the dream and where the person, what the person's free associations are to it, to what in their life might have caused it, um, it's, it got me into doing that, and I, I, I found I was, thank you, doing that quite well. <laughs> to it's draw a, out where, where the, what, what, what's technically called in psychology is the memory sources for the dream, and, and people do study that in sleep lab. They collect a dream and they find out where what memories might have gone to it. But we were doing it in a in an hour, or now it's in an hour and a half of asking the person for possible memory sources, which are often emotional. And um, I want to ask if there's a satisfying uh, what makes a satisfying painting. I think. I can give an example of one that we did at a conference in Arizona last year. And uh, somebody said before I started, I don't know how you're going to draw that. And it was such a challenge to me. And I just think that was one of the best paintings I've done. And I think it was because it, it used, I think it's very satisfying to use the page in, an un, in, a, in a way that is unexpected. And it surprises me and it surprises the person Having, who's had the dream, and I think then people are watching it unfold, and I think that is a really um, rewarding process. It's very relaxing, although I get very, very nervous before I do it, and I think this isn't, because it's so magical to me, I don't quite know what's going on sometimes. You know, it's a bit like the dancing caterpillar, isn't it? You don't really know quite what's going on. So when you start one, you think, it's going to work this time, and I get really nervous, and then it, it kind of does. Does it ever not work? Well, there, there are yeah, definitely. Like, well, I'm going to scrunch this up. I have torn out two pages, and it's been really quite a dull picture. <laughs> and sort of thought, oh, do you know what? I'm not going on that next page. <laughs> this is it, you know. It's just one. Yeah. And that worked here once, but then I. Yeah, we I actually partially disagreed really that Julia yeah. thought, oh, that wasn't so interesting. Well, Usually I it thought, was very interesting. No, this is a really interesting dream. It may, in its relationship with the person's, whoops, in its relationship to the person's waking life, was incredibly fascinating. But Julia, from the point of view of just the painting, it was all thought, brown. It's so okay. brown. <laughs> so that's often a problem. If it, you know, the colours, people say, yeah, it's all brown. So I'm like, oh, it's all red. <laughs> so <laughs> that, and that's, that, and that's, I can't do anything about that. You know, that's the dreamer telling me, oh, well, it was all, and sometimes, you know, oh, it was greys and blacks and whites, and that's beautiful. Sometimes mm. I've done a few which are really, you know, quite plain uh, uh, palettes. But, yeah, when they're just all brown. I mean, to draw a parallel with food, some of the best foods are brown. That's true. <laughs> quite unappetizing. <laughs> <laughs> and they're just delicious. Yes, so right, maybe, yeah. Yes. But then again, <laughs> what is a salad? <laughs> you know, you've got your carrots, you've got your tomatoes, you've got a lovely bit of lettuce, and there's some lovely colours in there. The feta. <laughs> this was brown because of the dowd the in this. Yeah, place. it was very dowdy. And, and so although the painting look, it could be said to be dowdy, it wasn't. It was, it was, it was really meaningful because of that. But my favourites are when Julia somehow manages to get 
an amazing perspective. Yeah, the perspective. Like in this one here that was painted in here with Michael Rosen. Yes, yeah. And the perspective, and to get perspective in, in 60 minutes, there's, there's some well, other ones as well. you try to fight with the, well, the paragraphs. Which are, I just want to get another well, that one's, perspective. That one's a nice one. This of a Los Angeles a woman who was, um, had been, yeah, in, it was yes. A so she dreamt of being in Los Angeles, which is where she had been working previously, and dreamt of a, a, a carjacking and people attacking her. But Julian managed to get the perspective of the cars. And the, and the four um, blokes. In, in, uh, and they were about to drop. The time. A, they were about to drop a match on a, on this kind of car, yes. weren't they? That had, you know, the petrol had all seeped out. So it was quite a sort of quite frightening dream. But you know. The, but a really satisfying composition. Yes, yes. Really good. so it's all about composition. Yeah, it is. It's all about yes. and colour. I mean, if that red wasn't there, mm. you know, it would be very grey, wouldn't it? It'd be very grey. Mm. And we found that later. It, she was actually one of the first people to go on the record against Harvey Weinstein. Yeah. The film mm. she said names her, and she's in the film. So yeah. it's quite fascinating. So she's Laura, who, yeah. you know, we don't want to tell people. Names, but we'll no, work on that. She, and this she, one she had a load of perspective as well. Yeah, we yeah, she did. So this one also but has This one was very interesting because talking about our reaction, you know, Mark saying that that was a, a really interesting dream and me saying oh, it was a brown. Our, we do observe our reactions and in fact our reactions to certain paintings have brought in the empathy theory that we developed because this painting we were doing three in a gut at a time. Now we only do one at a time because we, we're absolutely shattering doing it. Because you're, you know, you're, there's so much going on in your head. And um, so at uh, this time we were doing three at a time. And she was last. And um, she would not tell us the dream. And she'd sat there for ages saying, yeah, can I go next, can I go next? And then she just sat there and she wouldn't tell us the dream. And then you know, gradually, and we were both quite sort of frustrated because of the stress of it. But then afterwards, it was such a beautiful, poignant dream. She, her daughter was moving out, and she didn't know where she would live. And the dream, she kept starting off by saying, oh, it was called Where Is My Home? But she wouldn't tell us the narrative. And so I'm frustrated, I'm like, I need the narrative, I can't draw it. <laughs> but yes, it was about, she got to this red door, and she couldn't go in, her daughter was there with her boyfriend, and, and she, she was on this threshold of the, and it was so poignant, and, and then she just kept saying, I kept hearing, where is my home, where is my home, and oh, it was so beautiful, and there we were, kind of like, a bit grumpy, you know, oh, yes, yes. Yes. Oh, my so that changed us in a lot, the yeah, come on, get on with it, <laughs> yes, so that changed us a lot, that dream, that was very, very, that was very much a turning, and that was when I just said, can't do three in a row, you know, this isn't just this isn't just the performance, there's more going on here. And we've got to be more mindful, you know, of what's being told to us. Well and also cut yourself a bit of slack up yeah, you, yeah. because mm. if it's taking it out of you, yes. then, then and it, you don't yes. want to take too much in one go. Yes, and it was because we suddenly realised this is somebody who must have been in her forties whose daughter was leaving home. The daughter and the, the new boyfriend are going into their own house. And she's turning away, saying, she Where's my home? Way to look. And we suddenly realised this is, you know, uh, the effect this was having on us to hear somebody in that situation. Um, but I would point out, though, that Julia's perspective, Julia had, in, despite it being a short, yeah, it was very a, short. A very short um, painting mm -hmm. period, she managed to get a street scene with perspective by using the chapter headings. Yeah. And oh, with, a, and with a, a lamp post at the top of each, so she, she would manage to get perspective. And some of the perspectives are amazing in them to think they are achieved so quickly. Yeah. But the perspective of the lamp post yeah, along the street is quite something. No, no room in the, in, the, in the back of the Yes, no, no, no room. room. Yeah. 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 Value, importance and value, meaning. Yeah. I mean, the words that pop up are just quite amazing. But yeah, no room has something to be found there just by chance. Mm. Really, because um, as Julie said, she's chosen the pages, not because of the lampposts, actually. But these words pop up um, in a quite poignant way. Yeah, and like it says over in the corner, dreams, the courage led by intuition. 
Well, they're quite poetic, mm -hmm. but they sort of almost, well, it's very, it's, you know, we, we, we have done a lot of research into the surrealists. It's very much what they were doing. And, um, you know, so there's this interesting history of art and, and, and sort of how dreams are used in art, and then the kind of uh, scientific, you know, very thorough uh, use of science, which is, we just come together. Well, well, tell me about the science. I mean, mm. is there a satisfactory explanation for dreams from the science world? Well, that's interesting because when, before, while we were writing the book, we, we went, there's, there's a, a discussion, um, a monthly discussion symposium that loads of the dream researchers around the world join in on, and lots of them are neuroscience people. And they're interested in dreams because they think that the images you have during the night do something to your memories and emotions. And it's a type of processing that's going on during the night. And that's a very prevalent theory. And that's a dominant yeah, one, isn't it? This, this, is, dominant this, one. Like, this is this is your <coughs> while you're sleeping, your brain is doing the kind of the filing of what you've been through. Yes. And yes. Sort of marking important, unimportant, oh. shove that out of the yeah. trash, deal with later. Yes, so the idea that dreams have a role in the cognition that's going on is a very, very prevalent um, view. And, and it's, it's got in its favour the fact that we know that during sleep we process our emotions. And we also know that our dreams prioritise emotional things that have happened to us. So for that reason it's a very plausible hypothesis that there's one, one of the famous papers of this is dreaming, the title is Dreaming, the experience of memory consolidation. So the brain is doing the processing and the dream is your experience of that processing happening. Now, there's another view, which is the epiphenomenal view, which is that the dreams are just not doing anything. They, they tell you what the brain is interested in and that may have happened to you, but they don't actually have a role to play in any processing the brain is doing. Um, and I've always been quite intrigued with the epiphenomenal Quite, was quite sceptical, really, that dreams might necessarily do anything, because they all disappear quite quickly in the morning. So it's very easy to think that they don't have any effect at all. So I was always torn between those two theories. So, can, I mean, can they both be right? Can, can you have some dreams that are hugely profound yes. and are, are shaping your memories and, yes. and your cognition going forward, and, and some that are just confetti yes. in the wind? Yes, it could be. It could, in fact, and some of them, in fact, say this, that, like, just like you, you've said, that uh, just like our waking life thoughts, some of them are very purposeful and important, and some of them can just be ephemeral, very, very pointless uh, thinking. So it could very well be that. Um, but there's, so there's two main thoughts, and it could be that some dreams sometimes fit one and then don't fit the other. But Julie had always been telling me about work on storytelling, Stories, and we started to read about the use of stories in the human evolution, and how stories may have bonded people together, and also been used as a way, especially if the story is fictional, as a way of um, people exploring their own thinking and, and telling stories to other people. And it was really from that that we then, and they had a part to play in self-domestication of humans becoming domesticated, that they tell each other fictional stories, and, and there's a lot of work done on fiction, and the telling of fiction and the reading of fiction causes insight and makes people to become more, no, sorry, causes empathy, and makes people have more empathy with other people in different circumstances. And so it was from that that we made the leap, well, maybe dreams are acting like stories, and maybe they've acted over the time course of evolution, human evolution over about 80,000 years, which is how long this was storytelling. So maybe the storytelling bits of the brain have worked in the night, and the people who, it's well, it's well known, but the people who tell stories better have more evolutionary success. You know, there's lots of stand-up comedians who are got all the, the girls and boys after them. You know, and so they're, they're, there's, there's a benefit to being a storyteller, um, and a benefit to the group in having stories. And so we thought, well, maybe dreams are something similar. They're a different way of making up a story. I was talking to Robin Dunbar, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. up yes. at Oxford, who is fascinated by 
about this, this idea of why, uh, why some of us uh, are good public speakers mm. and some of us aren't. And he said, well, in any group, in, in our evolution, that's, that's how you bond. You need people to tell the stories about, we're great and those guys over there are rubbish. Mm. Um, and um, he said, obviously, in that setting, you need someone to tell the story and somebody else to listen. Mm. He said, a party made up of just extroverts is not going to work. Yes, that's very true. So yes. everyone's, everyone's got their part to play. Yes. You mentioned, um, I mean, we're going to hand over to questions in a bit. I really want to know about pandemic. Um, you mentioned um, the pandemic and, and yes. doing the project on, uh, during the pandemic. I want to know how people's dreams changed during the pandemic. Well, the um, one thought we hadn't thought, we hadn't really ignored the pandemic. <laughs> until Wait, well, you say we, I think we I, I, I was the telling you about the I, found I was going, when you say it, <laughs> why is everyone wearing masks? <laughs> no, I'm, 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 sorry to, um, I'm, I'm going to go to Elaine's one because Elaine's was, uh, Elaine who we've got here, so we, we yeah. suddenly realised, because you know, we were locked in during the pandemic and then and we were quite ignoring it really, and then we started hearing all these reports of people dreaming more. And so then would, Julia said, why don't we get healthcare workers and why keyword, the health key workers? And healthcare workers. Yes, and then uh, I had this one in which I dreamt of uh, a funeral preparation kit. This is after I'd heard of somebody who died of COVID. And that was the first person we'd heard of dying. And so I had this dream about a funeral preparation kit in, a, in amongst a, a box of oddities. And so suddenly we were thinking, yeah, there's all these people talking about dreams. And it's all getting quite serious. And so that was why we thought of contacting, or just putting it out there on the internet and on Twitter, if you're a healthcare worker or a key worker, would you like to have this done on Skype? And so we moved everything over to Skype, worked out how we could get different camera angles going in, different cameras going in for the person and Julia's painting and me and then broadcasting on Facebook Live like this is being broadcast and this was um, this was one of the first ones which was I don't know whether Elaine wants to say anything, you don't have to but yes. um, so so my nickname is Dream actually because I've always had a lot of dreams from when I was a small child so that's what all my friends call me and, but I had a very strange dream, even for me, and put it out on Twitter that I basically... So I'm an infection control doctor, but I was involved nationally in terms of the pandemic response. But this was at a point where, I, you're right, basically no one else was really... I had been eating, breathing, and sleeping the pandemic, and been in that situation where I posted to my Facebook friends on the 30th of January, this is going to get bad, guys. Like, I've been through four pandemics before. This is different. I need you to, like, start behaving differently. I need you to think about what you've got at home. I need you to have medical bags packed. We don't know how bad this is going to get. And so you're in this situation where you have all of this information, but you don't want to scare people and you don't want to talk about it. But everyone else is basically going to concerts and going, so um, I went to the more ballet last night, and I'm like... I worked a 20 hour day trying to get a PCR up so that we could even know that this stuff had come, but good on you, <laughs> um, in, enjoy your life out there, because it's going to stop in a minute, and um, frankly it's not going to be the same, it's going to change, and like, you don't want to be that person, but at the same point you're like, you can see it coming and you don't, can't really talk about it, and so um, yeah, I put out on Twitter that I, even for me, I'd had the strangest dream, where I'd been sitting in my office and I was so flu is going in X, the flu vaccine is going in X, and obviously the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine didn't um, go the same way. But in this dream, because we didn't have that information at the time, I was basically trying to like cook quail's eggs that had the vaccine in them and I was trying to peel them but people just kept calling me um, for results and so that I had to give clinical advice and there's these things that are boiling and if I don't peel these eggs then I'm just not going to be able to cure anybody but no one will leave me alone for long enough to happen 
And so I basically had this bit of a Twitter rant <laughs> about the stream. And then these guys got tagged and they were like, oh, so you know, you should tell Mark and Julia about this. So I was like, okay, this is a slightly odd thing and I'm kind of busy, but maybe. And these guys were just amazing. And I think they were just hitting that turning point where people were starting to realize what was going on. And I kind of- Early February. Yeah, I kind of felt like it was really important that I actually start having those conversations but in a really different way and also like to be honest it was very stressful um, and so just having a different route to be able to talk about what was going on was just incredibly valuable I and mean, there was that difference wasn't there with medical NHS workers and everybody mm -hmm. else so yeah but by talking about dreams it was kind of a forum uh, you know for, for understanding these fears and concerns yeah. that were that were there. And you could have that conversation in a less scary way. So I could feel like I could talk about it in a way that to be honest, apart from like those nearest and dearest to me, I just didn't feel like I could sit there and go, So I have an underlying immunological condition which means I've been ventilated twice for viruses. So I'm sitting there working on the front line knowing that I'm gonna have to go out and be the person that's managing these people who are having a really sick loss knowing that if I get it, then to be honest, my outcome is not likely to be great. And you can't have those conversations and process those fears in a very, it's not like you can go down to the bar mm -hmm. with your girlfriend and like have that conversation and a chat. And so it was just a really valuable thing for me at that moment in time. And I felt like it was valuable for other people to see that thing that was coming in a different way. Mm -hmm. How did you feel once you once you finished your session and you looked at that group of people as well? I don't think I had any idea how scared I was and how hard it was until we finished. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think it just made me, and I don't know if it was almost just having that hour of space mm -hmm. to even think about it because like at that point I was I was doing 18 20 hour days like there's a blanket in that picture because I had a blanket that someone had sent me so I could sleep in my office if I needed to like I had snacks we had like I had a blow up bed so that if I needed to just stay I could just stay because I knew at some point I might not be able to go home and so having that space to be able to talk about it and Actually, loads of my friends listened to the live broadcast and the number of people who messaged me who finally went, actually, I just really get it. Mm. Um, and it, it really changed <coughs> things for me because I suddenly felt like I had a lot of support mm. outside my husband who'd been carrying everything while simultaneously very scared because he knew what the outcome could be. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just all you love it. And it sits in my office. So everyone that comes in, we talk about it and we talk about the power of storytelling and we talk about the fact that spending that time to reflect hasn't gone away in terms of importance for us as medical practitioners. Actually, being able to listen to those inner dialogues is still important even now that the pandemic is finished because, frankly, there's always the next thing <laughs> that you are dealing with. So when I, I got in to see the guys up at Oxford who were trying to find the vaccine, and um, they said they said similar to you, they're working, they're cancelling all leave, uh, we're just all going to work until we fall over, we're going to stop all of the other things we're working on. And I said, oh, like what? And they said, like Crimean hemorrhagic fever. My and, husband's I went, and I was like, I'm sorry, should I be scared about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, that doesn't sound good. And they were like, it's kind bowler in sheep and it might get us all but it's probably going to be fine so it's down the floor. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's good to say. Top tip, watch out for that one. Yeah. Um, I can't even say it. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. What, a, what, a, what a fantastic story about um, you know, these guys. I yeah. just turned up right now. I used it to have a cup of tea. So it was but it is also just that trusting Twitter, we got involved in a storytelling event with the NHS just because they posted it on Twitter and we kind of went, oh, well we could do this and then, and this, this, yeah, and you're just 
sometimes Twitter is can be really good. People even give Twitter quite a good yeah, yeah. bashing. And actually, it's m mine's curated to it's a lot of nice jumper clad people uh, having <laughs> <laughs> super chats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, and it means that we've had an ongoing dialogue. Yeah. And well, we just met tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah but in terms of like virtually, we've yeah. uh, and it's enabled me to take it into other bits of my practice. Especially because I love the kids with kids, right? Kids are always fascinated to talk about their dreams. And so actually it's one of the things with my paediatric patients that you can do in a really accessible way. When they're scared, you can get them to talk about their dreams. And it means that it's a different route mm -hmm. so they can express their fears. And I would never start having those conversations if it hadn't been doing it. Oh, brilliant. Mm -hmm. my, I'm not sure where, where to put my patron because people just go, what's that? Dead brother, he's not dead. <laughs> 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 yeah, don't want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, much harder. Mine are just eight, and people are like, no, that's what? great. So you've made that up. Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting, actually, that thing about the blanket. I remember that blanket, particularly the purple yeah. blanket, because there was this home work, and we found that in a lot of the COVID paintings, that there was a a strange relationship between work and home, and it had blurred, yeah. and it had blurred in dreams. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there was another one by a doctor, which is downstairs, and um, he had been, I was talking to John about this earlier, and we, he had been, um, uh, uh, he had been, um, he had been pushed forward and graduated um, more quickly than he should have been, so he could go on more, so he could deal with COVID. But in the dream, everything in his life had similarly shot forward. So he'd got a child, he was married to his girlfriend, he'd moved into his favourite pub, that was his house. <laughs> you know, it was like a kind of, ooh, I've got a house, I've got everything had, had been um, accelerated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And so the crowds this was, were around. And this is, that, there's a lovely poem in this as well. Above her head it says, wife, girl, him, together, the two, dream. a lovely poem uh, but then that's his favourite pub there's his child you know, there's a, all these people on the beach being sort of chivied around by these men in um, uh, high, vis high, high vis jackets you know. so it, it's just fascinating every time and it showed that all the stresses as you were saying uh, were going into people's dreams so it shows you the real stress that people were under were there were there, did you notice symbolic stresses coming through? I mean, I, I just remember people saying when you when you, you dream that your teeth are falling out, that seems to be that something about change. There was it was symbolic with the woman who was a teacher uh, on on sort of furlough who dreamt of being inside a, a rib cage that might have been her own, and a robin was chip and that had COVID inside the rib cage, and the robin was chipping away at the COVID take it away. And it was very symbolic of the fact that people were finding nature to be, you know, consoling. And so especially going out and seeing robins. So uh, but the consoling nature of nature was, was uh, coming through on that one. Hmm. Shall I throw it on? Oh, I'm just thinking, nice. does anyone have any questions? Um, thank you, personally. And um, my question is, have you ever thought of doing this with children? Like maybe asking them about their dreams and illustrating it? Yeah, we have. We have done it with children and it's okay. been really successful. However, <laughs> as I say, we are, you know, we learn as we go along, right? So we did it, the first one we did using Freud's book. And of course it was... <laughs> It was really dodgy. Because <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't, you know, as you know, I choose the book after the dream's been told, blah, 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 and I had to go, what is going on? I'm not having that word in it, I'm not having that word in it, I'm not having that word in it. So you had to inverse, you went oh, back yeah. to it. And I, was, and I said to Mark, this isn't the way. So what we, what we do with children, which is really successful, and that was a learning experience, um, we have a, a, a drawing in which they go through uh, five aspects of dreaming. One of them is to draw the colours of the dream and we have sort of a hand that, that goes into a rainbow and they, they lay down the colours and then we say, 
did it feel like? What did it? And these words are all written all over the page, all these different ways to experience the dream. And then they turn the page over, and on the other side it says, now pay for the dream. And uh, so they've gone through all this kind of preparatory stuff, and they sit with their parents, so we're not on our own with them. And so they tell the dream to their parents. We, we find that actually the parents stop doing them as well, because they're quite fun to do, and they're very light, uh, you know, easy to do. And they're, But they really enjoy to, and we have had nightmares, children with nightmares, and we've said, when you've done it, So anecdotally, we have had um, people telling us recurrent frightening dreams and then they haven't had them again. Or when they've come back, they have been less severe and less frightening. So it's almost like airing the dream in this space has taken away its power. I don't know with the child, it was just what I said to the child, so I don't know, we never heard back from the child, but let's hope that that child wasn't uh, troubled anymore. And we give them away to schools. We say, you know, you can do this on your own. It's just follow follow the instruction. They have to turn the paper all round, you know, so one word's written that way and they have to turn. So the paper's yeah. becoming a messy kind of space for them. And then they turn it over in a big white space. They're like, oh, I can paint my whole dream now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, oh yeah, thank you again. <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, I was wondering whether any dreams that you've painted or kind of talked through has then triggered your own dreams and there's yes. been a bit of a kind of Ooh, yes, yes. Yeah, that does happen. Yeah. Uh, can't remember. Uh, yes, it, it has though. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's gone. Your kind of Can you remember any emotions attached to that? Or, or was it just a ooh, that popped into my dream? Yes, I, I just remember going, oh my goodness, that was that. Um, I can't recall now, but it did happen. Yeah, yeah definitely. We, it, we all remember at some point, so if you write to yeah. us, yeah. we, we write back <laughs> with each, but it has happened sometimes. Some of these are so emotional, these experiences, yeah. that it does then trigger something in us as well. Yes. Yeah. Which would make sense. Which would make sense. Mm, yes. Taking me. Yeah. Yeah. And I do, like I said, do feel like I go in and look around inside them. Yeah. Um, in my my version of them, obviously, you know, and from the story that's been told, and the, the kind of, you know, it is a bit like a detective story for me. It's like, oh, well, why was that there? And why did that happen like that? And so I think there's a puzzlement that's happening. And then that puzzlement comes into my dreams yeah. then, from someone else's, yeah, definitely. And from a dream sharing psychology point of view, it might, you know, could be looked at that one person tells the dream to another person, and then this person, because of that dream, produces their own fiction, which they would then say back. Mm. You know, so it, it, there would be a process then of the group yeah. dreaming for each, uh, dreaming back to back and forth, um, mm. producing new stories each time. Yeah. 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 What, what do you make of people who don't dream at all? I mean, am I just dead inside? Mm. <laughs> um, I think it might be, actually, if I'm being honest and self-disclosing here, it might be connected with my particular choice of intoxicant, I suspect. Have you done any research on that? Ah. I once saw a great TV programme about a member of the So Solid crew, a rapper, who gave up smoking pot after years of smoking pot, and he suddenly started to have, to have these most amazing, uh, vivid, graphic dreams. And what I'm saying is, I'm not particularly bonkers about alcohol, but my choice of intoxicant when I'm relaxing is a bit of pot. And I find, honestly, I don't fucking dream at mm. all. Well, my mother, who is 93, does not indulge in pot and doesn't dream. Right. So I don't think it's... I think right. it's just some people wake up in a particular phase and right. they just get on with their day. And it's just... You know, I mean, everybody dreams, but you just, just don't remember, remember them. them. Yeah. And but that's it. Oh, sorry. No, I just think that's quite an interesting phenomenon that that when this guy stopped it after a, you know, because yeah, he'd gone can't. three weeks into being without pot, having been an addict since he was fourteen. Right. And this guy was about thirty odd, and suddenly 
cascading in came this incredibly vivid dreams that kind of he couldn't stop telling people about. So you never been able to. Um, well, I haven't smoked pot all my life, but um, <laughs> I, I, what I'm saying is, in, in, in recent times, yeah, yeah, yeah. I cannot remember a dream at all. Yeah. Probably five or ten years. I, I, I've had the same recently. I mean, it. Uh, so I had I had cancer, I had chemotherapy, and it basically scours my inside. Ditto. And and I thought, oh, it's I used to have quite vivid dreams, and now I just get. Now that's interesting. Five years ago, I had chemotherapy, I had prostate cancer. Oh, I wonder whether it's. Wow, imagine that. There's, 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 there's something in that. It's just clobbers. I mean, it clobbers. It clobbers everything yeah, physically. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. why not psychologically? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. And as people get older their amount of REM sleep decreases greatly. Right. So that's one other thing, is their REM sleep periods will become really quite okay. short okay. across the night. You know, you're not talking about very, very long at all. And on top of that, although I'm not sure what pop is um, found to do, certainly with alcohol, that will, will further diminish REM sleep. So alcohol will stop people having dreams. Yeah. Does it so mean I'm not getting that important REM sleep that would... Uh, Really, you know, apparently we download during that REM period, don't we? Does that mean I'm uh, damaging this? It's inter just an interesting thing. I never had the opportunity. Sorry, I feel like I'm hogging. No, no, as, as people get older, they have less and less REM sleep anyway. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's they don't need, need, need it. it. So Maybe they don't need it. Mm. Right. And even if people are not dreaming when they're having REM sleep, it depends upon who you talk to whether or not that means that the REM sleep processing is not as good. Alternatively, while the REM sleep is doing some, something, you're not having this dream daydream that, that is a cherry on the cake that doesn't actually do anything. Yeah. It's, the, it's the epiphenomenal view. Yeah. Epiphenomena meaning something that doesn't have a function. Yeah. And is REM is remembering, is it, or does it sound something else? Rapid, rapid eye movement. Oh, yeah, it's when your eyes kind of go, oh, yeah. you know, under, under, you know. Mark, do you want to talk about the fact that you have phases of mm. sleep? Oh, because, yeah. because of REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep tends to happen in the second half of the night and the brain is very, very active and the eyes are moving around. And deep sleep or slow wave sleep happens in the first half of the night mainly. But the interesting thing is there's lots of work about slow wave sleep aiding in memory, that your dreams are less likely in that state. So, so, it's, so it's, it's, REM it's, sleep is the dreamy bit? REM sleep's the dreamy bit, but you do have dreams in non-REM sleep, it's just they're shorter. And so that may actually be the only difference between the REM. There's a bit of dispute about it, but uh, uh, but uh, one view is that the, the non-REM dreams are just shorter. So and the shorter sort of, dreams harder to remember? Because yes, and the shorter ones may be harder to remember. Mm. Yes. And that happens in what part of sleep? The, the non-REM non sleep, sleep, yes. Oh. Maybe that people just don't remember them. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe that. Yes. If you'd like questions, uh, when did you start doing this collaboration and how did it, uh, this happen? Did you know before each other? Did yes, you go to know each other yeah. do, doing this? And uh, also, have you had ever different interpretations of the say, like the dream of someone? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one that was very funny that was here. I don't know if you remember this one. But it was a guy who dreamt about coming into a station, and it was a kind of uh, two trains coming in together. He was going from one train to the other, but in the middle of that, in the middle of the station, he sat on the toilet. And Mark did not mention the toilet all the way through, and I was drawing it. I was thinking, why is he not mentioning the toilet? It's really, key. It's really key to his dreams, right in the middle of my painting. You know, the two trains coming in on a, on a, you know, like a cross. And uh, a great big toilet, and a bloke sitting on the toilet, you know. Anyway, that was very funny. So and then someone in the audience said, why haven't you mentioned the toilet? <laughs> <laughs> he, just kind of, he couldn't see my drawing, my painting happening at the time. I was thinking, why is he not mentioning the toilet as well? And that's why it's good to have an audience. That's and why it's, it's good been to so have brilliant artist. here, sometimes this room fills up. A, with people who've signed up ahead of time, but also people who just happen to be in the museum who then just sit and stay and, and listen to it. But it does help to have a lot of people giving different perspectives. Um, yes, you mentioned that, when did it start? Yeah, and right? if you knew start? each other beforehand, because I, if you knew each other before Yes, we, we, we do know each other. We try and keep that a 
bit quiet. Not we married. We have each other. But on the grounds of professionalism, we try. You know, we have we have the psychopath anyway, we're on and the psychologist. <laughs> psychologist and she's an artist so we're both sort of trying to emphasise the, the professional aspect of it but I've come at it like like we said earlier on as wanting to discuss dreams with the public and then this all sparked off as Julie said I, I can hate it which I, I would never have thought of yeah. as, as a, so, as and there is a there is a kind of tra tradition in, in in art of of working into books and and also you may know um, block poetry block out words yeah. and, uh, yeah. and you oh kind of find gosh. but you know so there's a that's not particularly novel and there's an artist who I've known about since I was a child and introduced I've written about in the book but introduced to me by my brother uh, called uh, Tom Phillips and he wrote a book called The Humument and it was a book that he bought in a in a bookshop second hand book and then he did what's called a, a Gestalt Kunstwerk which is a, a life's work I don't speak German, but I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce it. And he um, spent 25 years painting onto the books, and he created poetry, and he had a character called Toge, which comes from, is, is, is a word that can be made from several uh, different words, but I think mostly from the word together. But Toge goes off and has these kind of experiences on the book, and all the words kind of connect and make poems. So that there is a tradition of this, it's not a, a you know, but I, it, it's very unusual to do it in 90 minutes. You know, those are those are people who spend their whole lives kind of finding things, and you know, it comes very um, through, very much through a practice. And I'm doing it as a as a as a kind of a performance. So it's a different approach. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much nice. for uh, for your talk. Um, sorry, you, you might have mentioned it, but I might have missed it. The wording uh, throughout the, your drawing, is it something that you come up with, or is it like you pick up the words that you hear from the person? Yeah, I pick, I, well, I, I pick up words in the text that are linked to the discussion. So they are happening as the discussion happens. Mm -hmm. So I spot them and I draw around them, and, and sometimes I'm, ga like I say, I'm gasping because they're so relevant. So, for example, but, but you don't pick the page because no, of the no, words. no. I'm not. Yeah, I haven't read it. Yeah. I haven't yeah. read it beforehand. I just go. You know, we, we have three three goes at the. Uh, there's a. So I think I don't know if you mentioned this. But there's a there's a technique. So everything's done using a technique. So there's a technique called the Allman technique, and we do, we document that technique. It's five stages. So we go through five stages, <coughs> and during those stages, you you spiral into this intense concentration on the dream. And it's designed for working with non-specialists. Uh, so Allman is a bit of a genius, and he designed it as a technique for, for sharing dreams with non-specialists. And that's the technique that we use. And we, that, we, yeah. we've Sorry. kind of synthesized several things, and that's what's unusual. But the dreams are only found by chance during the process, so there's not time for Julia to have spotted them on the page. Uh, yeah. We had an interesting, the words, yes, the words. We had an interesting one in Los Angeles at the Flying Dream, oh, yeah. where there was a psychoanalyst and uh, anthropologist that in the one. audience. There were so many references to flying on the page. At the top as well, in the sky. To be there, in the sky, there's the word flying, flying, flying. Yeah. And the woman is flying, so I drew around flying. And he and just Julia went. found that. He just went. What page is that? And he wanted to check it, you know, and I'm just going, well, it just happened. I, I, you know, I could have chosen a different page and it wouldn't have been there. Just, just sometimes that happened, that it comes together. And this is why it's so weird when I do it, because I don't, and I get scared, because I think, well, you know, nervous. So I think, well, is it going to happen this time? And sometimes it doesn't happen. You know, like you were saying, how do you know when it's been a good one? Like, that one was a good one. Oh, so you pick up a page yeah. and you just circle... I the tear it out. I use the paragraphs to find the <coughs> shapes that relate to the, the story line in the dream, tear it out, and then I draw and I start. And in 90 minutes, I finish it. 
<laughs> and Michael Rosen, she found pe words on the page to do with Odin, who was a blind, no half stock. blind uh, god. And Michael Rosen had gone half blind mm. due to COVID, COVID, which yeah. is why we were discussing it with him. And he, a dreamy hat while he was. Recovering. And I've tried doing it with another book. We were asked to go to a Mary Shelley. It was like a, mm. a what was it called? Um, Romantics. Mm. And uh, anyway, I tried using brackets. It doesn't work. It only works with Freud's book. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's so many possibilities on because the page. It's, it's, it's just yeah. The, the, there's the notes. The notes are in italics, and they're all small. And there's all the numbers, and then there's. Mm diagrams and shapes and loads of different paragraphs so it's you know chapter headings and it just works with that book that is the book how so many copies of that book only one but oh, okay. i've got the book here this is a this is the book right but the book now is about that, <laughs> thing, <laughs> yeah, that thing. Got, yeah. and eventually our my intention is to put the book back together mm -hmm. right to create a book a gestum it just means, I think it just means um, a, like a holistic, a holistic artwork. There we go. Mm. And it, his one took him 25 years. It's used most often with people like Diagola who, who made um, stage works with people like Picasso doing the background and, and, the, and the costumes and then he would commission someone like Eric Sarti to write the music. So it was this incredible artwork. Mm. Amazing, and it's also used for um, Wagner. Mm -hmm. You have a question. Um, thank you for today. It's really interesting. Um, have you ever um, have you been able to identify similar patterns or similar stories, similar fears among these um, dreamers? Yeah, mm -hmm. apart from COVID, probably. No, it, it's it's. The only thing you do identify is usually, it's almost always somebody's dreaming of something that concerns them and they're dreaming metaphorically mm. about it. You know, a woman a couple of weeks back in an NHS group we work with uh, and broadcast it across all these NHS trusts. And it was somebody who, when she gets put on call, she dreams of being in an uncontrollable car. Oh. And that was a mm. very... That was, yeah, and she, she said, I often have this dream and the car is just, I can't control it and I've got my children in the car. Yeah, she's a grandmother. Um, yeah, she has, got my she children has two children in the car, and two and dogs. And then it crashes. And then it goes into a bush. It crashes and keeps having that. So the, the main thing we find is we usually do find some concern or life circumstance that the dream is metaphorically depicting. And it usually takes a while to really understand it, you know, using this technique. It's not quick. I mean, that one about the keys. Have you got the keys? That one. This was an opera singer. So we did a, we did a Facebook live event with opera, Scottish opera, right? And so we asked one of the, the singers. Sorry. Maybe it's not there anymore. It's in the book. That's very strange. Well, that was one of the first ones. Mm, I'm sorry, but anyway, it was it was about two pairs of keys. It's, it's in the book. Anyway, it was the next day. We're walking along, and Mark went. She's got familiar and unfamiliar keys in, in the book. two hands. And she's an opera star, uh, learning how to do a, a, a Britain opera. So it's very modern opera with unfamiliar and familiar keys. Oh. And I suddenly thought the next day, and I suddenly thought, oh, that's it's familiar and familiar keys. Nobody said it. And anyway, it's keys. It's keys. <laughs> it's keys. <laughs> and I'm going, what? <laughs> and she depicted it with me metal keys, which were either at one hand of familiar keys and one hand of unfamiliar, unfamiliar keys, keys, which it would be in oh, very modern brilliant. opera. And that was, and then we quickly sent a message to her, and she just loved that. And, yeah, and she was uh, going, of course! <laughs> so it doesn't, you know, even though it's 90 minutes, which is a long time to concentrate on a dream, sometimes it, it comes out You just need to later. sit there. Mm. Yeah. So that's there in the book as well. Well, that's how stories work in traditional stories, yes. don't they? They need time to yeah. uh, to penetrate. There we mm. go. It comes in sort of sprinkling rain rather than a torrent. Yes. Mm. So the, all these artists use this Alma uh, technique. Alma? 
or Hillman mm -hmm. technique. Yeah. Uh, no, that's a technique. Um, he was a. I, I don't. He want was to a psychoanalyst, but he wanted non-psychoanalysts and lay people to explore their dreams in groups. Oh. So it's the standard method around it's the that world. One. to do about having the dreams is, is to take record of them or write them down and, and you may get more and more. You'll get more. If, you, if you focus on them, then they get more and more. If you shut them out, they, you won't remember them. It's, yeah. like what you're, it's like what you're you're telling your brain to take. It's like when you get a car and suddenly you see, oh, everyone's got this car. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, it's yeah. like you're telling your brain. You to pay attention yeah. to it. What, what, what are you giving your attention to? And if you yeah. give your attention to dreaming, it will come. But you have to then have a book and well what I do is I have my phone and like blah, 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 you know, the first thing in the morning I, I put it in the phone and then I write it down later. Because if I write it down because my I'm very visual, the sentences and the sentence structures stop oh annoying. You know, I'm trying to put it into a shape and and you know construct it is difficult. So yes, I just take it. Yeah. And take record of whether or not it seems important oh, or interesting or not. Yeah. Just, just do that. So. And yeah. sometimes you get little bits as well. Yeah. You can take them. Because the more you do it, the more you pay attention to it. So. No, no, no. I was going to say, uh, we've got to draw it to a close. So if you have any more questions for, for Mark or mm. Julia, then, then do, do approach them mm. after this. But um, I, I guess I want to say thank you very much. Thank for you. For mm. letting thank me you. Think, think and um, what next for the project? Oh. We are, as you can see out there, we're now putting them onto people's t-shirts. Oh yes, we've got uh, where so your dreams. Dream. So, um, let's connect. Uh, <laughs> if you've got the ways, we've got the way of dream. So, oh, there it is. That's the way your dream. So we we uh, do exactly the same process, <coughs> but we put it onto a t-shirt, and then you walk around with it on, and people will respond to it so you're getting a constant um, discussion about a dream mm. but that's very surrealist kind of we, we've done that for the Surreal uh, international so international society, society for, for the, the study, study of surrealism, of surrealism. So we've done it that. there and um, they were really into uh, the performance and we also did it at, at the dream the Inter international the association, association for the study of dreams yeah. or another um, and, and at that, we, we did it very quickly in a, a conference, and by the third day of the conference, she had it, and so she wore it all around the conference. So that was really interesting, and people would comment <coughs> on the, the T-shirt. But the next thing we want to do yeah. is, um, I'm going to have the um, monitor, we, we haven't, um, this is really new, but I want to put the monitor, I want to know what my brain is doing, because I go off into a, a bit of a, Call it like a trance. Yeah, a trance. yeah. It's a bit of a trance. And I want to know what's trance when you're drawing something yeah. else's dream. So there is there mm. is a, a, a there's researcher. Portable, there's portable brain imagery, brain imaging devices now that are just strapped around your your head in in everyday life, and uh, you've got to be wire, have big wires from it. We will do that to yeah. Julia. That's 
that's what we want to do. Now. Because in that moment you're connected with that person yeah. who is talking to you. Yeah. It's like you're on the same wavelength. Yeah. And I want to know what. Yes, but you see, it's all very well like artists going. You know, I know this. This is what. This is this. You know, but it's good to have the team because he can see what's happening in a sort of a different perspective from a scientific perspective. So this is very interesting to me. Yeah. So we're going to try that next. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you so you much.